So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vagel Suzunis. I'm head of security infrastructures and services unit at Enisa. It's a great pleasure to be today with you. And it's a unique opportunity to discuss about cybersecurity on, for um, emerging technologies, a very interesting topic. We are going to spend around two and a half hours talking about um, very interesting uh, stuff. So thanks for joining. Um, this session is part of the a, a very important initiative of the European Commission, DigiConnect, um, the um, summer school university. It's, uh, it gives the opportunity to institutions, uh, staff, staff working for the institutions, but also outside uh, people connected online to learn, to understand, get the big picture, going into the details, understand how research connects to policy, how policy connects to operations. And this year, uh, the topic cybersecurity is really overarching, covering many interesting topics, um, sectorial uh, implementation of cybersecurity, talks about uh, you know, vertical uh, matters, um, technical uh, issues, urging technologies, 5G, IoT, and so on. So please bear with us. It's a great pleasure to have uh, today with me a very interesting panel of uh, very reputable experts. I will introduce them uh, soon. But before I go uh, into the details, allow me to say that the dates are very interesting because cybersecurity is getting traction, is recognized as a very important uh, topic. Recently, the European Commission has, um, uh, together with the member states, have actually uh, agreed on the Cybersecurity Act that gives um, a, a big push to ENISA, the agency that I'm representing today. It gives uh, many more tasks and many interesting activities uh, to do in the future, more resources, but also um, a very important responsibility to deal with uh, certification. I won't uh, go into the details of it now. We will have the chance during the two and a half hours um, to touch upon these issues and see how the um, European initiatives and the work of the agency relates to the topics that we cover. Um, this meant to be a, a kind of a training, a, an educational experience. And um, I would like you to think it like this. So please be open-minded, relax, think out of the box. Uh, be as interactive as possible with our uh, invited uh, speakers today and um, just uh, understand you know the the issues um, try to see you know how this can be useful for your uh, daily work and make the mess the most out of it we have uh, this the session is broadcasted online as well so we expect uh, also people to join us online and there is a possibility for sending us, uh, you know, comments via Twitter. And the hashtags are already in, uh, in the announcement. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce the first uh, speaker today. So it's um, Tony G. Tony G, yeah. Yeah, Tony G, associate partner from 10 uh, pen test uh, partners. Uh, Tony has 13 years of uh, security experience. He does uh, penetration testing, an important component of our work. So he checks, uh, you know, how systems work in reality, not in theory. And uh, we look forward to his presentation. He will tell us a lot about the dirty things that he has uh, found over the years. So, Tony, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to look at the Internet of Things and look at vulnerabilities in the Internet of Things. Um, so who am I? Who are we? Uh, so we're Pentest Partners. Um, we're a large team of ethical hackers. Um, and we've got quite a reputation for hacking smart devices and hacking hardware itself. Uh, we were involved in the, um, uh, the creation of the ANISA guidelines for, um, for connected security, um, which was really, really cool, really good to be involved in that. But as you can see, we've done quite a lot of different devices um, from, uh, from locks, which I'm going to talk about, tracking watches, kids' toys, 
adult toys, which I'm not going to talk about, so don't worry about that, um, and all sorts of different devices. But I wanted to focus this talk kind of on the smart home and on the Internet of Things. And, and of course, the smart home, you know, we've got this wonderful utopian vision of what it is, where, you know, you, you'll, you'll come home in your car, your garage door will automatically open. Your front door will notice that you're, you're nearly walking up to it and automatically unlock. Your lights will open and will turn on to the right light setting for you. Your heating will be the right temperature. You know, your kettle will have boiled or your coffee machine would have made you some coffee. It's just this wonderful utopian view of what the Internet of Things is going to do for us. I think it's kind of more like this. <laughs> and the thing is, this talk, I wanted to talk about hacking lots of devices. So in the past, we've talked about hacking things like your smart kettle. And your smart kettle's great, but realistically, the attacks are just one device. We're just going to get your Wi-Fi credentials. And that's pretty low, low, low effort and, and actually not a huge amount of value. But the problem with the Internet of Things is it's not just a single kettle. The Internet of Things, we still have our kettle or our device. But that device will connect to something on the internet. Then there's people using that device. Then there's segments. So the device will be on an internal network. The cloud service you're connecting to will be on someone's servers on the internet. You'll have devices that, makes that make that stuff work. Your home router, the, cloud, the switches on the corporate network. You'll have other users inside the internal network. You'll have people connecting to it yourself, perhaps, connecting to the cloud service so you can control your device internally. You have administrators of the system, the product that you've bought. You've got networking equipment that makes the whole internet work. And so when you come to attack the Internet of Things, it's much more than just attacking a device. There's a lot more to it. As attackers, you could sit on the Internet and target the device. You could target the users. You could target the cloud service. You could sit inside the corporate network. Maybe we've compromised another device internally. And then we can use that to target other devices internally, including the smart devices. We could have a man in the middle position between you as the user accessing your cloud service. We could target the administrators through perhaps phishing attacks. We could have malicious insiders inside the network. Or we could be nation states or rogue individuals compromising the network and equipment that <coughs> makes the internet work. So when you start to understand the Internet of Things and the threat landscape, it is really significant, much bigger than most manufacturers have thought about. But one thing that we are seeing a lot of with most manufacturers nowadays is that there's an API, a back-end API. But a lot of things manufacturers are outsourcing the development of their back-end API. And so they might contact an, indiv an individual firm, they will create an API, and that API will manage things like your watch, or manage things, your mobile, manage your mobile app that connects to your watch. But that provider also makes another API for another device. But the problem is, they aren't recreating something brand new, they're just going to copy it. They copy the old API, change the names on it, and make it look right. And so, actually, you could have a situation where vulnerabilities exist in multiple different platforms that are completely different manufacturers, but have all got the same back-end API. That's interesting, and it's something that we're seeing a lot of at the moment. And it's meaning that we're starting to see the resurgence of, of zombie vulnerabilities, uh, a, a term that I've coined. Um, because we're finding... Maybe, Tony, you explain a little bit what the vulnerability is, because we have a wide audience here. So yeah, so vulnerabilities, uh, ultimately uh, security issues within uh, applications or within, within systems. But one of those uh, vulnerabilities, those zombie vulnerabilities that we're seeing is a thing called insecure direct object references. This is a vulnerability which was around in around about 2002. We fixed it. It was on the OWASP top 10, which is a, a list of security vulnerabilities in web applications. We fixed it in about 2003, 2004. It disappeared off the top 10 because people were aware of it. So what is 
insecure direct object references. So applications typically don't validate that the end user is, is authorized to access a particular resource. So in the scenario we've got here, so the account equals parameter is vulnerable. So I log in, and I log in with my account ID, and that allows me access to my account. But the vulnerability in the account parameter means that I can actually change it to another ID. So instead of logging in myself, I log in with my credentials, and then I just simply, in the URL, just change to a different ID number. And then that allows me access to it. And that is insecure direct object references. It's that simple. You'd think people would be able to fix it, but the problem is they don't. And so just changing tack a second. How many of you got uh, keyless vehicles? Cars that you just don't need to press the button to get into? A lot of us. Good luck. These guys here are stealing this keyless vehicle and they're performing what's called a, a relay attack. So this is effectively boosting the range of the, the signal from your car going to your key and allowing them to unlock the car without actually having the key. The key remains inside the house, they use the tablet devices to extend that range. It's an incredibly common attack. Keyless cars are becoming a target, especially high value keyless cars. So these guys will eventually steal the car, they'll eventually drive off in, in the car, and ultimately they'll, they'll either code some new keys or ship it out, uh, outside of um, jurisdictions uh, or maybe even break it up for parts. So what a lot of manufacturers are doing, uh, third-party alarm manufacturers are doing, are using, are creating separate car alarms. So these are smart car alarms that you would put onto your keyless car so that you could then get a key fob to be able to unlock it. It's a bit of a backward step, but you know it, it kind of works. Manufacturers, I should caveat, are looking to improve the situation here. Not there yet, but they are looking to improve the situation. Perhaps with little accelerometers in the key fob, so that if the key fob's not moving, then the likelihood is the person's not carrying the key. Um, but in the meantime, we've got these third-party car alarms. And we wanted to have a look at these. And the reason we wanted to have a look at it is because the manufacturer of one of them made this claim. They said their product was unhackable. Never ever say your product is unhackable because that is effectively a unicorn. Nothing is unhackable. We had a look at Pandora, which was one of the alarms. Uh, we also had a look at Viper or Clifford as it's known in the UK. Both of these devices we looked at we found that we could uh, access the car type. We could actually choose the car that we wanted to steal. We could find the owner. So we knew where the owner lived, so we could then go and find the car. We could track the vehicle in real time, so we could see where it was driving. We could unlock the door. We could alert the driver with maybe a panic alarm or something and get the car to stop. Um, we could, in some very rare cases, actually kill the engine while it was moving. It depends on the interaction with the vehicle. Um, we could also, in some extremely rare cases, actually listen in to the in onboard microphones. So your Bluetooth car kit, for example, suddenly allows us to listen to what conversations are going on inside the car. And there's around about three million vehicles we discovered. And it was because of an insecure direct object reference. So this is the this is the app. So <clears throat> on the ID parameter, we just simply change that to a different one, meaning that we could then change the email and then issue a password reset. And the where does the password reset come through to? The email address that we put in, which is under our control. We then take over the account. Now the account is ours. Now we can just unlock that vehicle because now we're an authorized user. On Viper, it was exactly the same. It was a slightly different parameter, but it was the same concept. Change the email ID, issue a reset, and then the account becomes ours, meaning that we could then log into the mobile app. We could then do anything that the mobile app could do. Um, and uh, we worked with BBC Click to, uh, to put together a video to demonstrate this. And, it's and something we'd hope wasn't possible it. in real life. But worryingly, so the two is. guys here, the guy the in the grey hoodie was, chosen, uh, was Andy, the guy in the black the hoodie was Vangelis, not this Vangelis, who, um, um, who actually found the, the vulnerability. has no idea of what's about to happen, as first the car alarm goes off, and then the attackers take control of the door locks. Get out of the car. 
Give me your gift. Give me your gift, okay? Um, Vangelis is actually Greek, uh, but on, on YouTube some people thought that he was Eastern European, which was um, quite amusing. Um, but yeah, he also found the vulnerability, as I mentioned. Uh, and so, you know, it's pretty simple. We can, you know, steal your car to order, track it in real time and steal it, which is pre pretty bad. Um, so mo moving on from stealing cars to, to stealing stuff in your shed. Um, because, you know, more of us are looking to get fit, right? So we use bikes. And so where do you store your bike? You put it into your shed. But how do you secure your shed? Well, maybe you use a padlock to secure your shed, right? But the thing is, you might have chosen this padlock, the tap lock. This is a fingerprint-based padlock. And this fingerprint-based padlock, you press your finger on the button, it's pretty cool, allows you to unlock it. Really cool. Um, you can use Bluetooth to unlock it as well. Uh, it's also got unbreakable durability. Again, another manufacturer that thought it would be sensible to say their product was invincible. Um, and it does that courtesy of a metal called Zamac 3, which is a zinc alloy. Now, if any of you are scientists and know anything about metal, you'll know that zinc is probably not a good choice for security, um, uh, as we'll discuss in a second. And uh, it's also got military-grade AES encryption, like all of the good stuff does, right? And it's only £80 for this really expensive rubbish padlock. Um, but it has got some security features. Um, I, I think I'll call them flaws. The first of which is anti-shim features. This is a little lip, as you can see on the screen there, on the shackle. That weakens the shackle. So with some simple bolt cutters, we can cut it off. I've used a banana there, the universal measurement of a banana, so you can see how big the shackles are. It's not particularly uh, as big the bolt cutters are. It's not particularly big bolt cutters. But remember that Zamac 3 metal. Well, being a zinc alloy, it melts at about 400 degrees C. That's a normal blowtorch. A plumber's blowtorch will literally melt the lock off the shackle. Um, the problem is, of course, fire with a shed, sheds are usually made of plastic or wood, doesn't really go very well. So you're likely to burn your shed down, which is a bit of a problem. If I'm a thief and I want to steal what's inside your shed, I don't really want to burn the shed down. But remember it uses Bluetooth, this padlock. Well, the problem with the Bluetooth is it requires two codes to pair it. The serial one and the key, serial number and the key one. Both of those are derived from the Bluetooth MAC address. This is an address that is unique to this device and is broadcast at any time Bluetooth is turned on. So basically the device tells me the password every time it turns on. And it's so easy to do that we can actually hack it for real. So I've got a little Bluetooth adapter on the end of a, a, a long US, uh, USB adapter here. I just simply press the bottom button twice to turn on Bluetooth and then press go on my little script and what should happen is it should find it and unlock it in seconds. So now I can literally just go around to any of these locks and just uh, unlock them to order, ultimately. Um, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound that military grade to, to me. Um, but it's not quite as terrible as this padlock. Um, this padlock... Uh, uh, one, of, one of the guys I follow on Twitter was sent. Uh, the lock picking lawyer is a, an amazing per guy at picking locks, uh, mostly traditional locks. And, um, and he was sent this fingerprint lock, and the manufacturer said, this lock's invincible. Really? <laughs> you know, come on. Nothing's invincible, remember. He sent it to them, and they said, look, you will not defeat this lock. And uh, what he noticed is you can see I've circled the screw there. He just unscrewed that screw and the lock literally fell apart. <laughs> um, so he went back to them and said, you know that lock that you said is invincible? Well, I used a screwdriver, unscrewed it, uh, and this was their quote back. They said, well, the lock's invincible to people who don't have a screwdriver. <laughs> really? All right. So those are kind of like more on the commercial side, on the, on the individual side. But what about when we start thinking about industry? There's a term which is banded around a lot at the moment, Industry 4.0. This is essentially indus Industrial Internet of Things, or SCADA, or ICS, Industrial Control Networks. And um, this is, a, uh, this, this is a, a nuclear power plant. Um, I can't remember where it is, somewhere in Russia, I think. And, uh, and it's, I just chose it because it's a, a, a fairly generic power plant. The interesting thing about nuclear power plants is that they've got really good security around them, right? Because you don't really want people breaking into them. 
But the problem is that that means it's also really, really hard to monitor it when things like that happen. When things like Fukushima happens, you can't really send someone in to go and monitor it. And so what power plants are now doing is they're putting all of that industrial control systems that were behind big people with guns on the internet. So now they're having the ability to remotely monitor these services. And they're doing that through lots of different devices like these ones here. So on the left-hand side of the screen now, we've got a 3 or 4G gateway. Um, <clears throat> and this is essentially allowing your industrial control network to be connected to the internet. We find that in that particular device, there's an authentication bypass, meaning that we don't need to log into it. We can just bypass the authentication, and we've, we're, we're now accessed onto, the, onto this, this system. The one in the middle, the Siemens Scalance switch, uh, this has got both an authentication bypass and a vulnerability that we're still disclosing with the manufacturer that allows us to, um, to decrypt all of the data on there, meaning that we can decrypt administrative credentials and user credentials, allowing us to then take over the device and giving us a man in the middle position on that switch. And then the other one, the one on the right hand side, is what's called a serial to Ethernet adapter. This takes all of the data that goes to these, these uh, industrial control networks and converts it into Ethernet capability to go over the Scalance switch. So if you imagine you've got lots of these different systems controlling different things connected to the Scalance switch, the Scalance switch connects to the, to the 3, 4G network, which connects to the internet. So we essentially bypass the authentication. We've got access to the switch, and now we can control the data that travels over it. So how do we find these devices? Well, of course, open source intelligence is our friend. Things like Shodan. Shodan, the search engine for devices, rather than things like Google, the search engine for web pages, allows us to find devices. If we search for Moxa, you can see there's 10,000 devices on the public internet that potentially could be vulnerable. So indulge me for a second. Does anybody have a super yacht? No? No? Um, so interestingly, there is a lot of commonality between a super yacht and industrial control networks. And the same with maritime, because industrial control networks are on these systems. You don't think that a captain sits up there in the bridge and starts turning the steering wheel and it turns cogs and turns an actual rudder. No, it's an industrial control network. So when they turn the steering wheel, it turns the, turn, tells the system to turn the rudder be, uh, at the back of the yacht. I'm thinking more of a bigger yacht than this pleasure cruiser here, but I couldn't find a picture of a massive super yacht. But not only that, you've got other connected systems, things like GPS devices. And you've got those connecting over the same serial to IP connectors, connecting into things like your electronic chart display and information systems. All of those use the same industrial control technology. So how do we access it? How do we compromise it? Well, remember, we can compromise that 3 or 4G network. We can then gain access to the Scalance switch, and then we can start to interact with the serial to IP connectivity. We can start to intercept the data and modify it. And I've got a little video which will explain this here. So um, what we're going to do is this is GPS data in the black screen on the right-hand side there that's flowing through. And what we're going to do is we're going to modify that data on the fly and change it so that we can control that data which is particularly concerning if we're talking GPS data, because now I can tell the captain that they're in a completely different place to where they think they are. Equally, the same applies to industrial control networks. So we're just setting it up here. As Soon as we poison this traffic, you'll see on the right-hand side, it will change slightly. So we now have control over that data. Now we can just change the, the location of the ship. We could also, uh, modified data that's traveling over those industrial control networks. Pretty scary. So let's talk about something a little less scary. Let's talk about hacking your children instead. 
Um, because yeah, why not? Uh, so I'm sure I'm sure you know. Of course, we're famous for hacking my friend Kayla. My friend Kayla has been quoted in multiple research uh, documents. Um, it's actually quoted, I think, in in uh, in the U.S. Uh, State Bill 327. I think it's also in Anissa's um, uh, documents. Um, but the interesting thing about my friend Kayla is it's just a Bluetooth device. You have to be within range to compromise it. But nowadays, parents are looking to track children and are looking to use these things, kids tracking watches. The problem with kids tracking watches is they're really cheap. And the problem with that is there's no money for testing. And that leads to a lot of problems. So this particular device, we've looked at loads of them, but I'm just going to pick on this particular one. Um, virtually all of them have insecure direct object references. Remember our old friend from 2002? And with this particular device, the Kids Watcher, what an awful name for a, for a kid's, kid's tracking watch, I have to say. Um, we're able to track the child's location in real time. Uh, we can do things like turning off or setting off geofencing alerts so the parent thinks their child has left a particular area, goes and tracks them, and then we can go and steal them. Um, we can call the child. We can ring up the child pretending to be the parent. Worse still, we can spy on the children. So remember how my friend Kayla got banned in Germany because it was a bugging device? These are all remotely accessible bugging devices. So now we've moved from, you know, a 30 meter range to anywhere in the world we can listen in on your child without any authorization. In this particular device, we found 3 million devices affected. Other products we've looked at, in total, we think we've got about 20 million different devices around the world that we have control over or could have control over. Um, and this particular device, what we did is we created an app that allows us to show you how we can track your children in real time. It's pretty creepy. Uh, we called it the Kids Tracker. Uh, we, we actually called it Remote uh, Observation and Location Finder, short Rolf, uh, as in Rolf Harris. Uh, if anyone remembers the UK, the comedian who was, um, yeah, got arrested for sexual offences against children. Um, so a bit tongue-in-cheek there. But interestingly, what we can do is we can actually zoom in on this map. And uh, I did some searching earlier on. I, I should caveat. This is fake data. I'm not tracking real children. I'm not a psychopath. Um, so, so this is fake data, but it uses the same back end. Um, but you can see, uh, if we just zoom in on these couple of children here, this one here, we can see it just slightly moving um, uh, in, in real time. Now, it actually updates every five minutes, but we do get historic data. We do also get sex, name, age, height, weight, so we can pretty much choose our favorite child that we want to kidnap. It's pretty awful. And the app has no security to pre pre prevent this. Um, it's really bad. But you know, it's not just that device. Uh, we looked at another device, um, this one here. Uh, this one exposed 7 million devices. Tw the Chinese original device manufacturer has around about 367 different types, each with their own millions of devices attached to it. Um, and that back end was ThinkRace, uh, and all of their APIs are vulnerable. Another one that we looked at was from Gator. Gator uh, said that they were the most reputable GPS watch for tracking your children and old people, because people with dementia often uh, leave the, the safety of their car carers, people are using these watches to track elderly relatives. And this company said that they were the most reputable firm. So you'd think they'd done some testing, right? You'd think they'd done some security testing. So when we contacted them, they said that they didn't have money for security testing because otherwise they couldn't have a Christmas party. So we can see where their priorities lie, right? So how do we go about fixing this mess? Well, some tactical things to do. As individuals, use password managers. I can't recommend them enough. Password managers will make your lives more secure. Just get them. Use two-factor authentication as wherever you possibly can on as many systems as you possibly can. That will greatly increase the security in your personal lives. 
At home, change default Wi-Fi passwords. Set things that are really strong, things that you can control. Stop, for the love of God, tracking your children. There is much less risk now to your children than there ever has been before. You do not need to track your children all of the time. Uh, and yeah, get a normal padlock, for goodness sake. Um, but at a more global level, at a more, more generic level, these systemic flaws are arising from simple things, mostly hard-coded backdoors, Lack of API or API authorization, simple remote code execution vulnerabilities, basic stuff that we have discovered time and time again on pen tests. Testing these devices is fundamental, but supply chain is absolutely key. There's a, a talk in a couple of a uh, couple of days' time about supply chain vulnerabilities, and supply chain is fundamental because so many different manufacturers are now outsourcing their development that now you can't just rely on the brand. You can't rely on MySafe to be the particular end product. It's usually some back-end Chinese developer. So if you do outsource the back-end, you know, make sure that you put security into, into there. Make sure you test that security. Make sure you ask some key questions, like how do you actually verify and prove that your, that your products are secure and your end users are authorized? Use tools that are publicly available, like the OWASP Top 10. There is one for the Internet of Things as well. Use those, test it, validate it. But at a more, more generic level, regulation is on its way. In the UK, the Departure of Department for Culture, Media and Sport have brought out some guidelines. They are going to make those law, which is great. Um, really, really good. Over here in, in Anissa, of course, Vangelis has been involved in, uh, in, uh, in, in this, as we have in creating the, law, the, the guidelines. Um, it's not law, unfortunately, at this stage. I'd like it to be law. I really would. Um, it is very complex, and I can kind of understand that. It's covering lots of different things, but it is very good. Uh, over in the US, I mentioned already State Bill um, uh, 327, which is in, in California. Uh, that is mandatory, but it's so vague that I think you could easily bypass that. Um, but it is great. It's getting there. We are getting closer. What I'd really like to see is it must be mandatory. I'd like it detailed but not overly detailed. I'd like automatic updates for the foreseeable future. I'd like default passwords to be a thing of the past. There is always going to be a password I would suggest on there. Make it unique. Um, any credentials that I provide or any data I provide needs to be securely stored. And as end users, why have we not got the ability to return vulnerable products to store? Same way your sofa. If you get a sofa and your sofa is found to catch fire, easily you'd be able to return that and get that made fireproof or made safe or even get a refund on it if that's not possible because that is what the law states well we should have the same and also those vulnerable devices when they're found to be vulnerable should be removed from stores and not continue to be sold <clears throat> now i want to leave you with one final device the apple watch series 4 i'm sure a few of you have got them they're great devices Interestingly, they have had a lot of pen testing done on, on them, which is why it costs £300 rather than £20. But it does have one interesting uh, vulnerability. And, and this is that the device has got fall detection. So the fall detection allows you to, if you have a fall or if you give it to an elderly relative and they fall, it allows that watch to detect that they've had a fall and then automatically alert the emergency services and then a nominated contact, con a contact, a contact, perhaps yourself. Really good idea. Your elderly relatives don't need to do anything. It will automatically help them. Little bit of a problem if you happen to be a man and you have the watch on the same side as your wrist when you have some personal time, like this chap did. This chap fell 627 steps, was sedentary for five minutes, and his watch automatically called his mum and an ambulance. Um, so yeah, just bear that in mind if, if you happen to have some personal time. Um, and, and that's it. I'm, I'm not sure what time we've got for questions. Vangelis did say I could spend a little bit more time, so I did. Um, have we got time for questions now, or do we want to do them at the end? Well, that was the scary start, you know? So I think he deserves a big applause. <laughs> Thank you.
Any quick reactions, any quick comments, any quick um, questions? Please, uh, use the mics because we are broadcasting. Uh, do you have uh, in place, for example, some uh, procedures for detecting uh, powerful live attacks and uh, transforming them into powerless uh, hackers? Do we have any any uh, tools? No, uh, but um, that is very much a, a risk. Um, and especially with the Internet of Things and this industrial control systems being put on the Internet, it's very real that you can cause impacts to it. Power spikes are certainly something that we're going to see more of, I think, as more devices get connected. Once attackers realize that you can compromise lots of devices at the same time that are connected to the mains, and then suddenly turn them all on at exactly the same millisecond, what's that going to do to power grid networks? They're gonna, they're, are they going to be able to ramp up at that particular moment in time? We see it in live sporting events, you know, half time in a, in, a, in a World Cup match, suddenly everybody goes to their kettle to turn on their kettle to, to make themselves a cup of tea or, or, or whatever. And so there aren't necessarily any tools available apart from the tools which those, man, those, those uh, electric firms have already got, um, but it, I think that is going to become very much a real risk. Thank you. So we are running out of uh, time. So before we go to the next speaker, allow me to say that Enisa has done a lot of work on IoT security. There are very interesting documents that you can download, you can uh, read them. Um, we are um, getting a lot of um, appreciation for this good work. Actually, NIST and other institutions are following this uh, work and uh, they referenced us um, for, for a couple of years now. So it's a great opportunity to beef up. I know it's um, extra work, you have to read it, but and we remain at uh, your disposal, you know, if you have any additional comments. So, great, so we, the first presentation was very, very good because we managed to scare you, so now we have your attention. And with this, I go to the next speaker. He's actually a very senior uh, manager and research strategist at SAP, so, Lokmar Lodz is here with us to present a very innovative way to discover, uh, to deal with vulnerabilities in open source uh, software. So, Lokmar, yes. the floor is yours. Thank you. Microphone is on, slides are on as well. So, uh, thank you for in, inviting me <laughs> to, be, to be here. And uh, actually, I'm uh, grateful for being the second in the row or so because that saves me from explaining what a vulnerability is. Yes. And uh, it also uh, helps me to motivate uh, the, the point that I'm, that I'm doing. We are moving now in the world of developing software, actually, in the way how typically large commercial systems like SAP's ERP systems uh, are uh, developed uh, these uh, these days. And uh, due to these developments, which I will illustrate, uh, we have to deal uh, not only with uh, new and unknown vulnerabilities, but in particular with known ones. Tony was explaining the example of the object references where vulnerabilities that were known for years still exist because these things are reused. And uh, if we move to the uh, to a software development world where, uh, where open source software is heavily used, we will see the same uh, effects and, uh, and situations and have to react to those. And this is what my, what my talk is uh, about. A uh, few words uh, on myself. Yeah, my name is uh, Volk Malotz. I'm with SAP Security Research. So uh, I'm uh, leading a team of researchers that are looking into those uh, software-related security issues, uh, open source software, uh, as I'm uh, talking about today, as well as web application uh, security, uh, uh, application self-protection and other related topics. So what I'm going to talk about today is first to uh, give you an impression of the role that open source software plays in today's commercial software developments. I will then move on to talk uh, about the security risks that uh, come along with that and then uh, discuss uh, an approach, uh, actually our approach, on how known vulnerabilities can be managed in such contexts. Ah, yes, right. This is, the, this is the right, this is the right point. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is an, an, a slide that gives an overview on uh, 
how the past and the new realities in software development, and in particular in software technology stacks, look like. If you look at the left-hand column, this is as the world was 20 years ago. Uh, at uh, SAP, at SAP, here is just a prototypical example for other large software vendors as well. Uh, however, I'm with SAP, so I can best talk about our systems. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we might have been using a third-party operating system or a third-party databases coming from vendors with whom we had uh, contracts uh, related to maintenance and support. And everything that was coming on top of that in the technology stack, so the application server, the application itself, the user interface was more or less proprietary code developed by uh, SAP employees and uh, maybe partners who were also under contract. In fact, with 90, leading to 95% or more of the code coming from SAP itself, being under the control of our company. And I said, this is uh, not a different picture from other uh, software companies uh, at that time. 20 years later, now the situation is much different. Uh, our applications are delivered over the cloud and they are part of a rich infrastructure system in which all types of uh, open source uh, contributions are taking place. If you look at the right-hand column, you see things like, uh, say, a cloud technology infrastructure, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, Docker. These are all names of open source projects, large pieces of software that also today provide the infrastructure in which our applications are running. And that continues over the, uh, the stack towards the, the application layer. Web applications are consumed via the browser. SAP is not developing any browser. These are typically uh, open source contributions, Firefox, Google Chrome, and the like. These are the environments through which applications are, uh, are consumed. At the end, uh, instead of having 95% homegrown code 20 years ago, today we might have 5%, maybe. That introduces a large uh, dependency on the uh, open source components that are part of this infrastructure, as well as on their security properties. And to make things even a bit more complex, we can look at the picture like this. Using open source component, uh, the, uh, open source components does not mean that uh, you just introduce one piece of code, one package of code and the like, and that's it. But these code parts introduce themselves, their own dependencies. Open source components are using themselves, other open source components, in order to provide the functionality. Here you see a typical example on how such dependencies look like, and it's not meant for you to read into the details, but you see that there are very rich dependencies. And it's even a small example, because uh, from our own empirical uh, research that we, that we have been conducting, we see that uh, on average, a module like the top one in the graph on the right-hand side has some kind of, say, about uh, 95 dependencies on average. What you see in the picture here is around 40 dependencies, so it's much more complex than what you see here. And uh, what is also illustrated by the picture is that uh, the indirect dependencies are even larger and richer than the direct dependencies. With direct dependencies, I mean code, uh, open source code that is explicitly on the top level included in an SAP application code, for instance, while an indirect dependency is all those components that are indirectly used by the open source component that is included itself. So we see 80% of the code typically being on indirect dependencies, which increases the complexity because you have to go further down in the dependency graphs in order to analyze such components for uh, security. And uh, to uh, conclude that dependencies are not only introduced at design time, so it's not enough to just uh, look into a piece of code that uses open source at the point of time when you declare these, uh, these usage relations. But there are also dependencies that are introduced at runtime by dynamically including libraries, which you do not know before, at test time when you have particular test environments that come along with these projects, and even through the uh, infrastructure in which a, com uh, a, soft a piece of software is assembled these days. We call that the build pipeline. So what, uh, what you see here is that uh, A, the dependency on open source source software in commercial developments is much richer than it used to be 20 years ago. B, it's 
complex because there are many dependencies that need to be considered. What does it mean for security? It means that if there are known vulnerabilities in these components, it is very easy to overlook them. Because if you build the software, maybe there are old components in there, uh, maybe these indirect dependencies, which you don't see at the beginning, uh, include such vulnerable components, and it is a task to manage those. Is that a relevant problem? Yes, it is, because if you look at examples, and yes, if you look at, at ex examples, uh, you see that uh, breaches caused by known vulnerabilities have uh, immense impact on uh, business and on society. Good example is the uh, data breach that happened at Equifax. I guess some of you have heard about that. It happened two years ago. Equifax is uh, a financial service provider in the US, uh, which is dealing with credit ratings and uh, information like that. And uh, they lost, uh, I think it was millions of social security numbers of their clients due to a data breach that was caused by using a vulnerable open source component. So they were using these uh, component called Apache Struts, uh, which is, uh, say, a technology environment somehow buried deep in the infrastructure that is dealing with web infrastructures uh, and the like. And they were using an old component which was known to be vulnerable but was not detected uh, by, by them. And the impact is heavy. You see these two examples on the right-hand side. Uh, the costs that uh, were caused by this breach are estimated on $1.4 billion. And on the bottom side, you can also see uh, that uh, there was a heavy impact on the uh, on the stock price. You see these two uh, situations. I don't think I have a pointer. Um, I can do that for you in the, in the room here. So you so see these two <coughs> declines in the stock price in 2017, which was directly after the breach became known, and also in 2018, when uh, Equifax had to uh, report losses in their financial statements, which were due to the follow-up costs of the 2017 uh, event. So uh, it's uh, not only that these things are happening, but they're also happening in sensitive environments and can cause uh, a lot of uh, costs and uh, other types of, uh, of impact. So, uh, that shows that uh, the problem of known vulnerabilities in open source software is not just some abstract uh, thing we talk about, but it's reality and uh, it's uh, highly relevant. To be more general here, <laughs> to be to be more general in here, uh, so the uh, SNCC has done some more uh, wider investigations into uh, the impact of the problem of using components with known vulnerabilities. Also, Tony has mentioned the OWASP top 10. Uh, OWASP is this open source web application security project, which is regularly reporting on the most important vulnerabilities that occur in the uh, software and web application environment. And this one, A9, using components with known vulnerabilities, is not only one of the top 10, but is, according to the analysis that the SNCC company doing, is the one that has the, uh, the highest, uh, that is the, the most frequent one causing security breaches and uh, is uh, the one with the highest percentage uh, of uh, root causes for breaches that occurs among these OWASP top 10 examples, which um, you can see in the table on the left-hand side. And it's not only cases like Equifax, there are also others. Uh, many of you, I think, recall the Panama Papers, uh, which leak was also caused by a uh, open source vulnerability uh, that was that was known and uh, was not removed in in the process. Uh, is that going to converge? Uh, actually, not because the same company also did an analysis on uh, the uh, on the publications of open source vulnerabilities year by year, and I think this uh, picture is speaking for itself. Uh, the problem will not go away. It's rather expected that it will grow exponentially as, it's, as it did over the past uh, 10 years. Having said that, let's now look into what we, what we can do with it. We saw the complex dependencies, we saw the relevance of known vulnerabilities, what is actually to do. And we move to the next one. There are basically three tasks that need to be approached. 
The first one is to identify the vulnerabilities. So the question behind that is, which are the known vulnerabilities, and not only which are the vulnerabilities in general, but to be more precise, answering the question of which code is affected by a reported vulnerability. One thing you have to keep in mind is that, that there's a tendency when you use open source that you include the full libraries in your code. While maybe you only uh, use uh, a few parts of this code for your actual applications. Uh, in fact, uh, what we observe is, is that in generally only a fraction of the imported OSS code is actually used in, in practice. So it is important for the assessment and for the prioritization to know which precise uh, methods and classes of your code are actually affected by such a reported vulnerability. This is the question of assessment. Uh, the question is, uh, is the vulnerability then actually exploitable in a given application context? If a vulnerability is in a part that you don't use in your application code and that is not called by your application, then its mitigation has uh, likely a lower priority for you than those parts that are actually executed in, in your code. So the question behind the assessment is, how can I find out if this vulnerability is actually exploitable or not? And last but not least, uh, the question arises on how to react if you find an exploitable vulnerability. And uh, there are, uh, the, the obvious strategy is of course, replace the component with the vulnerability by its newer versions. Uh, but that's not always the uh, most effective and, <coughs> and recommended way. In particular, if you uh, have complex dependencies where the impact of replacing a library is not known from the outset. So I will, in the, in the following few minutes go uh, in a little bit more in detail of all of these uh, parts of the of the problem first uh, identification as said before uh, it's uh, important to understand which vulnerabilities exist where they are where they are reported and that's also not an easy task because the information is typically scattered across heterogeneous sources there are a number of vulnerability databases there are a number of other reporting channels that are that are typically used so first of all you have to find those things and second what you find in the databases is like what you see on the top right of this slide is that these descriptions are in natural language and they don't give you a direct link to the code. Actually, it's a, this is done on purpose because also uh, vulnerability disclosures should not give any information to attackers on how they can exploit these vulnerabilities. Uh, however, if we want to assess our code, and we, if we want to find out if this vulnerability is of relevance for our code, we need to match it to the code constructs. So we have to go move this way to the uh, situation that you find on the uh, bottom right of the slide. Uh, you cannot read it, it's also not meant for, for reading. <laughs> uh, what is important for you is, is to see that you need to have information about the actual names of the methods in which the vulnerability occurred and that has been replaced, if this is classes or, or methods or interfaces and the, and the like, uh, in order to precisely locate the place where this vulnerability is occurred and which you can then use to check if this is of relevance for you or not. What comes on top of that is uh, that uh, not all of the vulnerabilities that are fixed by the developers are actually reported in the vulnerability databases. What we've seen more and more is what is we call silent fixes. These are uh, security fixes that are introduced to the to the component that are published on the uh, on the open source project, but that are not reported to the usual vulnerability challenges uh, channels, and uh, it is equally important to identify those ones. What we are uh, using here, a very interesting research area. However, no time to go into the details on that is that we use machine learning in order to automate this process and use machine learning not only on the metadata level, as many other approaches do, so looking into the authors, the name of the names of classes and methods, but to do that on the basis of the actual code constructs. What we, uh, the, the assumption behind that is that uh, security fixes in code show certain characteristics like patterns of, uh, of code instructions and the like, and we are using machine learning to identify those patterns and to classify code uh, if uh, it is a security-related code or not. 
assessment. As said before, uh, the question behind that is, is to validate if vulnerable code is actually executed by the application. And the diagram shows, say, a, uh, say a simplified version of how we use this in order to prioritize the uh, analysis and investigation and mitigation of uh, vulnerability. Um, as said before, typically applications occur large pieces of code that are normally not used. Only a fraction actually is uh, is used in practice. And we use a combination of static and dynamic analysis techniques to find out if the uh, a, a reported vulnerability on an OSS component occurs in code that is actually used by the application. Static analysis is a technique that looks at the code infrastructure, at the uh, dependencies you can find there, the uh, inclusion of code files and the like from other sources, while dynamic analysis is actually an uh, analysis technique that works at one time, where you run test cases on, on, the, on the code, and uh, uh, with that you can track the control flow within the code and you can see which methods are actually called or, or not. Both of these approaches have their pros and cons. This is why we use both uh, in, a, in a combination to um, precisely identify which vulnerabilities should be prioritized because they are actually exploitable and which can be uh, prioritized lower because uh, they are likely not being used by the application. Last but not least, mitigation. So as said, uh, there are several options on how we can deal with these found vulnerabilities. Uh, so one, uh, and the one that comes immediate to mind, is update to the uh, fixed uh, version of the respective code. But that's not always the, the proper one due to the dependencies and the impact it can have on application functionality on the interfaces that are used. For instance, say, if the new version of the code includes new parameters for methods to call or so, that might have, uh, that might cause a huge effort because you have to, uh, say, propagate these changes in all of your code and recall the picture of the dependencies that can be quite uh, a lot of effort. So we also look into other options. One of this is, uh, is called downporting. This is actually take the fix that the, uh, that the authors uh, of the component did in their commit and apply it to the old version so that the old version can be used but still is security fixed. Or a uh, third option that we are considering is to introduce uh, safeguards. That is basically workarounds, the uh, workaround, the, the vulnerable component in order to avoid this vulnerability being uh, exploited. So how can we decide between these uh, different options for mitigation? We are looking into metrics that can uh, give rise to the recommendations on what is best to do. For instance, the uh, what you see here, it's also not meant for reading, just for illustration. What you can could see on the, the right-hand side of this, uh, of this slide is uh, metrics that are uh, aiming at assessing the effort and the impact of updating a component, which we can use in this decision process to help the developers decide on uh, which mitigation option is the most uh, suitable. However, as said, this uh, typically requires uh, activities and additional effort by the developers. Uh, this is normally not a good thing to recommend additional effort to the development uh, communities. So we're also looking into how this um, problem might be um, more addressed in a more automated way. One thing we are currently investigating into is uh, taking into account the uh, already mentioned fact that only fractions of codes are used is to uh, use a technique which is called slicing, which reduces the code automatically to only those pieces that, uh, that are used. So you uh, take the whole library, you investigate which um, classes and methods are actually used by the code, and you try to cut away the rest. It's not as easy as it sounds because the dependencies can also be very complex here. So, but this is an approach to automatically reduce the attack surface of your own application while still using the uh, the open source components that you that you want to use. And uh, having this approach, addressing the three major questions of identification, assessment, and mitigation, the last step that remains. Uh, in the light of uh, reducing the footprint of this technology on the development environment is to fully integrate these analysis activities in the security tool chain. Our experience shows that uh, whenever you come to uh, 
development community, in particular if it is within a company with all the deadlines, the pressure on go-to-market, the DevOps style of development where you have frequent release dates, it's never a good idea to say, here you have a new tool, please use that uh, together with all the other 25 tools that you have in your chain, uh, analyze the results manually and uh, then uh, change your code accordingly. Uh, what we need to do is uh, rather to automate this process as well, so that all these analysis activities are automatically executed and uh, are also presented to the developers in an as easy to consume way as it, as it is possible. And this is what we are doing by integration into this build process. So now, instead of giving the tool to the developers, the tool and the method is integrated in our build processes, which are used to uh, assemble software and to make it executable. Uh, this leads to uh, a situation where all of the code developments that are done in Java uh, are automatically scanned with respect to the known vulnerabilities and with recommendations on their mitigations. That minimizes the false positives, that also prioritizes the runtime funding, and uh, as, uh, as said, uh, it's key to generate easy to understand reports. However, with this approach, we think that we minimize the footprint into the development, which increases the, the, uh, the probability of a routine use of these technologies. And in fact, the tool that we are talking about here is now the recommended uh, tool to use for open source vulnerability analysis within the company with our thousands of developers who are working uh, on Java code. Uh, for, to conclude, I think I have not so much time. Uh, let me look into the, the research challenges that are still open. I already talked about the code classification and the silent fixes, so I will skip that for now and uh, focus on a new type of attacks that we also have discovered during the work uh, on uh, open source vulnerabilities. And that is uh, the introduction of malicious open source components. So there are uh, new attacks being observed where uh, malicious code is uh, uh, integrated in open source components with the intent to have this malicious code being uh, present uh, through the dependencies that are occurring in a large set of, of, uh, of applications. And there are pretty sophisticated things. The example is just a simple one. It's called typo squatting. We have observed that uh, some attackers are providing versions of open source components which sound just similar to the original ones. You find some examples here in the list, for instance, using uh, the uh, the name UR, uh, URL-lib instead of URLib or, uh, vi or, vice, or vice, uh, vice versa. So with that, the attackers try to trick developers into including these components instead of the other ones. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, even though it is a, a, a simple approach, it is pretty effective because those typos are typically, uh, particularly if you are in a hurry in your, in your developments, are not so easy to spot. So uh, we are want to focus our research on these two topics, the uh, automation of, uh, of code classification and the investigation into malicious OS components. And then I have only one slide left which gives a little bit of the history. I also will not go into the details, but I wanted to convey the message that this is an effort that we are now doing at SAP Security Research for about uh, six for about six years. And it actually started with an FP7 funded research project uh, where we were, uh, which was actually on a different topic, uh, on the configuration side of security rather, but we uh, developed these ideas also in the course of these projects. We continued in a rich interaction with our internal community, with the external community, with publications and the like, with another EU-funded projects, this time with EIT Digital, a uh, project called, uh, called Vamos, and these were all ingredients that helped us to develop this tool, which is now uh, the recommended tool for Java developers at SAP, which we are aiming at also spreading to the wider open source communities. We are currently discussing with the Eclipse Foundation in order to have that a standard tool for them. And, uh, and that is my last uh, word on, on this, that is also actually available to everybody who is interested in using that because we have open sourced the tool itself. So if you go to this link or so, you can find the tool, you can find the documentations, and if you are interested, uh, we uh, appreciate if you could uh, try it out, play around with it, and uh, help us to further develop it. Thank you. Thank you, Folkmar. That was great. So bottom line, software is 
sometimes uh, crappy. There are vulnerabilities, there are problems. Also open source software that we normally say it is tested by more people also has problems. So that was a great uh, presentation. Kudos to DG Info at that time, DG Connect, who sponsored, you know, these research projects that lead to this interesting uh, methodology and tool. Uh, this is very interesting. So we have time for one question um, from the audience here in Brussels or even in Luxembourg. If there is any question, otherwise, no, thank you. So Falkmar, thanks a lot. So let's give him a big applause. <laughs> Excellent. Bravo. So well done. And now we go to the third colleague that I have here, uh, Alyosha Pasic from um, Atos Origin, uh, from uh, uh, Technology Transfer Director and uh, many, many years of experience, you know, in uh, research projects. So his talk is about the whether cybersecurity risk is important and uh, what do we do to mitigate it. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you for inviting me here. And uh, I'm also happy to be the third speaker. As you said, you're happy to be second one. Uh, because in the first presentation, I think uh, you've seen a lot of threats and also some vulnerabilities. So probably uh, most of you uh, uh, started to panic or even become paranoid calling your children not to, to leave house or <laughs> lock them in uh, when they when they when you come home uh, my presentation is actually called is this cyber security risk important to me so uh, at one point there was uh, this question do you have keyless um, a car do you have a remote uh, control for a car and I thought also oh yeah I do have so is it uh, this threat that was shown in the first presentation, is it important to me? Uh, I think the, in my case, I park car quite far away from my house. So I thought, actually, it's not uh, so important for me. What I try to say is uh, that I will present, present, I will do presentation which is which will try to convince you that what is important is risk and not uh, so much threat or vulnerability. Uh, of course, vulnerabilities are important and threats are important, but uh, if you don't put it in the context of your own situation, uh, I think it is it might not be even important to you. So I start presentation with this uh, <coughs> division, let's say, known uh, versus unknown risks. So we have uh, risks which are known and we know how to deal with these risks. We have uh, risks which are unknown and uh, sometimes we don't even know how to deal with these risks. So these are, let's say, uh, um, quite abstract or quite uh, easy um, segmentation of risks. So what to do with uh, known risks? We know how to deal with them. This is uh, business as usual. So this is uh, what any uh, IT specialist can do because there are clear procedures what to do. I think uh, here uh, we have many examples in uh, IT and also outside of IT. Uh, the unknowns, unknown, here this is a, a term popular, they say that they attribute this term unknown, unknowns, I, I hope I pronounce it well, unknown, unknowns. <laughs> they said uh, this was uh, um, Donald Rumsfeld, they attributed this uh, famous uh, statement about uh, unknown, unknowns. Basically it's, it's a question of, uh, you know, crystal ball, what will, we don't know what risks are and we don't know how to deal with them. Some of these uh, unknown unknowns are um, uh, low frequency, high impact risks. For example, 9-11 uh, was classified as a, as a low frequency, high impact. And in IT, definitely there are some events which are unknown unknowns and we don't know when they will happen or how, what to do about them. Uh, then we have uh, things which uh, are uh, unknown knowns. Let's say these are uh, things, uh, risks which are known, but uh, we need more data. So we need experimental. This is a guy called Leonard from the Big Bang uh, Theory. I don't know if any of you knows. I guess the people who are watching this serial know that uh, there are two guys. One is a experimental physicist, and uh, another one is uh, Sheldon, which is a <laughs> theoretical physicist. So what we do about uh, unknown knowns is collect, do more experiments, collect more data. We need quite a lot of data to be uh, sure how to deal with risks, but for uh, known unknowns, we don't know how to model these risks, so we don't know 
how really we should react on, uh, on these risks. Basically, what is risk? So, very simple definition. If you multiply likelihood and consequence, you get risk level. So, uh, likelihood sometimes is called probability and consequence sometimes is called impact. But it has to be impact for you. So, you have to have clear what is your asset. Uh, obviously, uh, children are important assets, at least if you think about, you know, when you get retired, they will pay maybe for your <laughs> retirement. So, they, are, they can be considered as an asset. Um, Anyway, the, uh, there are more complex definitions you will see later of risks, and uh, th uh, they involve also calculation of uh, threat and vulnerabilities. Think of it this way. So uh, when you cross the street, every day we do a lot of risk assessment, and we take a lot of decisions which are involving th this risk assessment. Crossing the street is a good example, because you, this is something we do thousands of times, or maybe not thousands, but hundreds of times. Uh, and uh, it gets complicated if you have a complex uh, crossing like this one. You don't know, uh, maybe at first you don't know how to react, but you need more observation. This is what uh, was called uh, known unknowns. You need more data. Uh, there are some people who are especially vulnerable, like blind people or older people, and they need some assistance. In case of uh, cybersecurity, good examples are SMEs. SMEs are uh, typically do not have capability or don't have know-how to deal with uh, cybersecurity risks, they need some assistance, maybe uh, some uh, mitigation from the cloud, from a bigger company, subcontracting, or cyber insurance. Or you can be just distracted. So even uh, if you have all the knowledge about risk, if you never have all the mitigation measure, you just can have one moment of distraction, and that's it. So I think we are all familiar with risks, uh, dealing with risks in the physical world and uh, in um, what is uh, changing in a cyber world is that the trust is uh, the one of the basic uh, becomes one of the most important actually ingredient in this risk assessment so we need trust in supply chain we've seen uh, recently uh, this situation with huawei uh, which is a part of the supply chain uh, the, we need the trust in the process how is configured if it's uh, configuration done well in the other procedures a uh, lot of different uh, trust elements in uh, cyber uh, space. So here, uh, what I wanted to say is that the need is to shift from threat-based model to risk-based model. And uh, we've seen a lot of threats, which actually also in the previous presentation, which might completely, um, maybe they will not interest you at all, because you don't use this lock, you don't... Uh, uh, program uh, uh, with uh, you don't use open source libraries or, or whatever. Uh, again, known unknowns. We have in this situation in uh, as the cyberspace is met getting more complex, a lot of this uh, relationship, trust relationships, and the other source uh, sources of uh, potential uh, threats, insider threats, uh, outsider threats, uh, supply chain, etc. Uh, an example, here is, uh, I, I, I made this slide, actually, uh, this is a slide made by Jorge Cuellar from Siemens. Uh, this, this is before I knew about these modern locks, and this is a very old-fashioned way to steal a bike. So you steal one piece, one piece from here, one piece from here, and you have a bike. Uh, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a just a different uh, way to, to do it. Anyway, what I want to here to show is a metaphor for uh, software, as it is, uh, as uh, Folkmar said, it's based from different libraries, different software components, and sometimes you might attack one component, which is uh, uh, or uh, uh, provided by one uh, software developer, and uh, and then um, take a piece of the another one and get the whole uh, access to the whole application. So the in composed system uh, we had uh, uh, we used to call it service oriented architectures now is everything moved to microservices and um, the software is not a monolithic piece of uh, anymore so it's based on uh, different uh, uh, different parts and uh, it's easy easy to attack parts separately uh, one of the key questions is uh, that we got from the customer how much is enough how much should we invest in the risk? Uh, how much should I care about? The, does it mean that I spend more, uh, I will be more secure? Is it cumulative? And uh, is it, for example, more wiser to, exp uh, to spend in uh, operational expenses as uh, uh, capital expenditure? Capital expenditure, for example, is spending on licenses of software or, or uh, 
um, other things, uh, or operational expenses, which is a staff basically maintaining this um, security management and mitigation measures. Uh, operational expenses are much more expensive. So if you have, for example, uh, CM, which is a, a mitigation, uh, CM is an acronym for security event and information management. Uh, maintaining this, you need a staff that is looking at events, that is processing these events, uh, alarms, uh, false positives, etc., which is, can be 10 times more expensive than uh, license for CM. License for CM, there are open source licenses that are free, and some of the more expensive CM software is 100,000 euros, but uh, operational expenses will be probably 10 times more than that. Uh, this is a kind of uh, metaphor again. Uh, I, I use quite a lot of these metaphors to explain it. Uh, this is a comparison with uh, 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 cars and uh, uh, the risks at the road. So we have, uh, for the road, we have a lot of uh, security which is built in in, uh, in the road engineering. So we have uh, the, the, the proper engineering of the highways, of the signaling next to the road, which is uh, warnings that are telling us how to drive. We have vehicle circulation rules, uh, like technical check. Uh, once a year, we need to, especially for older cars, to go to technical check, matriculation. Uh, rules uh, at, uh, for driving with uh, police getting uh, putting you fine and uh, placing radars. Uh, vehicle has some of the built-in measures, etc. So all these are uh, different metaphors which sometimes have uh, equivalent in uh, cyberspace, sometimes not. Uh, for example, uh, there is a question, should all uh, uh, machines that get connected to internet get technical checks before they connect to internet, some kind of uh, cyber security essentials that they need to have at least minimum set of uh, cyber security mitigation measures before they connect to internet. Probably here in the in the European Commission, your uh, all the tools that you connect to the internet, it, is it mobile phone or or, uh, or laptop, have some minimum uh, security measures already installed. At least in Atos, we have, for example, a minimum profile that has to be there before getting the access to internet. So, uh, does it matter the cybersecurity risk? Does it matter size? So yes, uh, uh, it does because the, the, the smaller, as I said, the small and medium enterprises are speci uh, specifically vulnerable because they don't have this capacity to uh, react, to implement mitigation measures. Uh, there are also different types of risks for a larger organizations that I will show in next slide. And uh, there is a, a NISA study on this, I think. This is, by the way, not from the NISA. This is from Atos study in 2013. We, we try to see what are the, the most important threats and risk uh, per sector. And for example, in public sector, um, the, besides uh, usual errors, insider threat, uh, insider misuse was uh, one of the biggest risk. The other sector have uh, other t type of risk. So uh, once again, <coughs> not all type of threats are applicable to all sectors and all organizations. It's very important for each organization to define what is called risk profile. Public sectors uh, uh, especially are vulnerable because they have other things which are not necessarily uh, business uh, qu qu quantifiable uh, impacts. So here, for example, I'm talking about openness and transparency. It has to be the public sector services have to be uh, accessible and open to all citizens. And uh, there is, of course, a reputation which is uh, not easily uh, quantifiable. Uh, okay, some essentials. Finally, we got to risk management essentials. I think uh, it's comparable to what Walkmar said about vulnerability treatment. So we have a first step context establishment. Then there is a big mega step called risk assessment with identification, estimation, evaluation of the risk. And then we have a final uh, step, which is uh, risk treatment. Don't get confused about different uh, terminology. So um, threat is, uh, is used in uh, many of these methodologies. Vulnerabilities are uh, also used. But basically, you have uh, risk as, as a pair of unwanted incident and assets. So sometimes it's one on one. So we have uh, one uh, threat affecting one single asset, which is called single risk. Sometimes one threat can affect many assets. Um, again, there are uh, different names, sometimes safeguards, sometimes uh, mitigation measures, security controls. Uh, and don't get confused, because in different methodologies, they are uh, using different names. 
The first step is context establishment. Here, again, we have to describe target of analysis, uh, identify uh, and describe security assets. Uh, assets are uh, the things that you have uh, from the business perspective, but also from the IT perspective, they, they have to be quantified. Uh, the impact on business, for example, you might have um, IT asset like a server, which is uh, uh, very vulnerable, but no no connection to your business, uh, or at least the impact is very low. Uh, then you have uh, to identify, describe uh, profiles, threat profiles, and identify risk criteria. I go very quickly because there is a lot of details here. Uh, in the main uh, phase of risk assessment, uh, you need to identify your risk and validate risk model uh, to estimate uh, these risks. Here you need some historical data, if, uh, if possible, and to evaluate risks. Finally, in the risk treatment phase, you need uh, to treat. Uh, you might choose mitigation measure, but you can also treat risk by doing nothing. So there is a possibility to say, okay, I accept this risk, because uh, it's not always necessarily to do something, especially if this mitigation measure is very expensive. Um, some of the, I, I put here a couple of examples. Uh, very typical mitigation measures are firewall, uh, intrusion detection, prevention. I talked about CM, antivirus, and anti-malware gateway. All of them have some of the issues, open issues, some of the challenges. They are not perfect, and uh, there will always be a residual risk. So uh, one thing I think which is important, even if you treat risk, it's still risk. If you, even if you uh, mitigate risk, there is always residual risk. Which tools to use? There are many of these. Uh, most of these are also listed at ANISA website. Uh, there is even standard 27005 that gives uh, general advice. And um, basically we have, we can group these uh, risk assessment methods and corresponding tools into do two groups. One is uh, doing quantitative, mathematical, based on mathematical formulas. And another one uh, group of tools is doing uh, qualitative uh, methods. Uh, Again, uh, many countries have their specific, this is a, 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 let's say, legacy from the different developments in the past. They have their uh, country-specific or predominant tools in a, in a country. For example, in Spain, uh, it's a, a public sector is using Magritte uh, methodology and a tool which is called Pilar. In other countries, could be another one. They're all comparable, but they are not necessarily interoperable. So here is a, 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 an issue maybe for European uh, interoperability at European level. Few observations. Uh, I already said simple uh, definition of risk. Uh, it's an estimate of probability or likelihood and impact or consequence. But then you can get more complicated with mathematical formulas that involve uh, uh, threats and vulnerabilities and uh, make uh, this uh, model out of it. Uh, I already mentioned that there can be exemptions. They are authorized non-compliances. So sometimes management is saying, okay, we know that this uh, the port in firewall is open, but we want it to be open because we need it for our business. So there are exemptions from the uh, that that are accepted by the by the management by those that are taking decisions. And again, um, these accepted risks are still risks. Mitigated risks are still risks, and also the fact that risk assessment process is uh, auditable. Uh, an audit can bring additional risks. Okay, a little bit about trends. Uh, looking into future, uh, this is trend has been for many years, so it's not a new trend. It's alignment of business risk, information risk, and technology risks. Uh, basically, we have a uh, notion of risk is uh, very well understood by uh, the higher manager, the upper management. So there is a trend to, uh, to make integrated risk management and to link this technology risk to the business impact. Uh, this is an example of the impact on a business. On, uh, on, you can uh, not maybe read, but in table, this table, uh, we did also uh, a project. Yeah, we did project to estimate the risks which are not uh, quantifiable. So for example, reputation risk, you cannot really quantify this type of risk. Uh, the second trend is uh, trend, trend is uh, automation of risk assessment. And here uh, we are in the future, we are probably uh, going to have uh, artificial intelligence based risk assessment. So here there are uh, many uh, tools and many work 
ongoing to make machine readable risk uh, assessment um, uh, policies and rules. Uh, there are um, impact as can be expressed in machine readable uh, language. And uh, the idea is then to use tools that get uh, uh, to automate this, like uh, maybe CM or the other type of uh, security mitigation measures that can deliver real-time information and change this risk assessment in the real time. This is very important because uh, uh, now what is done is this risk assessment is probably uh, done at a stipulated moment in time. So it could be once a year, once a month or once a week, doesn't matter. It's not uh, real time and it's not continuous. Uh, one project which is already dealing with this is called CyberWiser. This is uh, an ongoing uh, H2020 project. It is uh, doing risk monitoring. In this case, it's feeding the um, cyber range tools and uh, it's produced uh, machine readable risk profile and uh, machine readable uh, rules for uh, risk management risk assessment sorry uh, okay so this is again from the project from the cyberwiser uh, there are four different types of indicators uh, business configuration indicators vulnerabilities test indicators network monitoring, monitoring indicators and application monitoring indicators so based on these four type of indicators uh, the, the let's say the the actual real time status of the risk is uh, is uh, computed. Conclusions. Okay, the good thing is that cybersecurity is increasingly strategic. So the all the CEO level uh, are aware of this, uh, and they are very familiar with the notion of risk. They know how to do business risks. So it's uh, it's a good starting point point to, to approach cybersecurity from the risk uh, management point of view. Uh, the bad thing is that challenges multiply uh, very fast. We have seen uh, the in the first presentation the uh, new threats and uh, uh, vulnerabilities have been published every day. Uh, the adoption of solutions is very slow as well uh, as transfer of research results into practice. And I'm talking here uh, because I'm involved in many research projects and uh, the, 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 the adoption is very slow, sometimes even uh, not existing. Uh, the ugly thing is that uh, in the future we need to speed up all the things. So we might uh, add another layer of complexity, uh, kind of I mentioned machine readable uh, rules and uh, to have some sort of uh, artificial intelligence that is uh, uh, incorporated in the uh, engine, risk assessment engine which means that uh, heuristic rules will be produced and will be adapted to your risk profiles. And I think this is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as we see, risk is inherent in all things that we do, in all products, in all uh, components, software. And then it is our attitude to risk. So whether we accept the risk and we do something to manage it or we just leave the risk as we have seen you know at the beginning with the presentations of tony where many companies decided just to ignore the risk and bring you know products in the market that were not very secure so um we have time for one quick question from here or from luxembourg please hello um i'm curious how far would you go in using machine learning uh, and uh, artificial please press the button because we in order to both classify and uh, confirm also known and uh, unknown uh, risks. This is uh, any mitigation measure that you introduce is bringing new risks. I mentioned that if you, if even if you have auditors doing auditing uh, of the risk uh, management in your company, they are also <laughs> risk because they are outside of the company. They can bring new risk. So any uh, security control or mitigation measure firewall, uh, the, the uh, CM, doesn't matter, is bringing new risks. So this is why uh, there, it's continuous process and automation. So if you bring yet another la layer of complexity, like the automation of risk, it will bring new risks with it because it's uh, uh, susceptible to attacks. There will be new attack vectors. So it's a never ending game. It's just that uh, it needs to be reassessed. Anyway, we have a we have a topic on artificial intelligence coming. Before going to the next speaker, I should say that, you know, we've seen already two presentations affiliated with uh, European uh, funded projects. So for many, many years, uh, DigiConnect, the European Commission has invested a lot of money, you know, in research projects 
that are working on numerous aspects of cybersecurity. We see now the results, the fruits of this work. More and more initiatives are coming, I know, with uh, more investment. So please stay tuned. I'm not saying this for the local audience, but mostly for the ones which are uh, online. There are many more opportunities for uh, getting grants and uh, projects funded by the European Commission. So limited time for a couple of questions uh, for more horizontal issues or cross theme or cross presentation the uh, matters from Luxembourg maybe from the colleagues here sir yeah maybe a more address to mr. Pasik um, where do you put uh, security policies and or standards procedure whatever in comparison with risk management so in other terms are there still a future for security policies or should we try to move our uh, response or, or prevention measures towards constant risk management? Uh? Security policy is uh, definitely has to be in a loop. It's one of the security. Security is not only about technology. So when I spoke, spoke about mitigation measures uh, or security controls, not necessarily sh they should be limited to uh, technical means, but also to security policy. So uh, it could be, for example, password policy, update of password policy when there is a continuous risk assessment finds that the password policy is obsolete. Uh, this means that uh, uh, as, a, as a one of these uh, measures, uh, and we should always have in mind, security is a people process technology. So people process technology means that all three needs to be updated and uh, security policy has to be updated continuously as well. Uh, as it is now in most of the enterprises it's very static and uh, it takes uh, time for, to, to update to make a decision on updates once that uh, the risk has been detected and uh, the, so the, the whole cycle is very um, uh, slow and it's not uh, continuously uh, evolving or in the, in the same let's say in uh, the loop is not closed and uh, first we have to integrate and to close the loop and then to automate it and make it more automated. Thank you. Any other question from the colleagues here or from Luxembourg? No? So then maybe allow me for a few concluding remarks from my side. So cybersecurity is an important topic. It has emerged over the last 10, 20 years as an important aspect of uh, our digital life. It will uh, continue to become a more uh, imp important topic because technology is very pervasive. Uh, we talk about smart homes, smart cars. Um, we use more and more devices. We have different digital identities. And um, it's only a matter of time when we will be personally victims of, uh, of an attack. Um, we have to do much more, definitely. And uh, not only on a personal basis, but also to protect you know, our critical infrastructures, our big assets, and we see you know, all these developments going on. Um, the European Commission um, has recognized you know, the importance of the topic since long, and there is a big list of uh, initiatives started 10, 15 years ago, and they you know, emerge and become more uh, elaborated and at the highest level. And um, the last developments is the NIS directive implementation, is we talk about you know the CSA, the Cybersecurity Act, the, the new extension of the mandate of ENISA, and with the new commission we hope to see even more initiatives coming down the road. There is a lot of discussion about 5G security, so this is a very interesting topic. Uh, it's a journey. There is no destination, so we are in an endless journey, and it will never arrive. And we will have to do our best to protect, uh, you know, our families, ourselves, our identities, uh, our societies. Um, it's a horizontal topic. It has to be somehow sectorialized. It has to be defined into a context. That's why there is a lot of horizontal work, like, for example, the risk assessment. But there is a lot of and the artificial intelligence, for example, or the vulnerability work for open source. But there is a lot of work nowadays for sectorial. Uh, so you will see soon that we will be talking about, you know, aviation and cybersecurity, energy and cybersecurity, health and cybersecurity. So it will be 
somehow contextualized in all uh, societal settings, and it will get a, a very specific flavor. Uh, and this, uh, I'm representing this organization, it's an EU agency. Uh, it's an institution that exists for 50 years now, it has delivered a lot of interesting work. And for all of you that joined the training and the session today, you can download our reports, they are for free. You can um, get a feeling of what we do and how we spend taxpayers' money. We are, um, we deliver quite interesting uh, presentations and quite interesting uh, work for member states and for the private sector. If there are any comments or suggestions, happy to answer them, you know, offline. Also, the European Commission maintains a couple of very interesting, you know, websites where you can download documents and read, you know, policy initiatives, but also very technical documents. And there is a big list of European R&D projects that have been sponsored over the years. I am not aware of the total number, but it should be many million euros that have been invested over the years on cybersecurity related R&D projects. We heard today a couple of presentations, you know, that presenting that presented results from this project and uh, many more initiatives are coming down the road. I know that the Commission will invest much more on this topic because it becomes a very important priority. So stay tuned. I hope we gave you an appetizer to become more familiar with our work and the topics that we are dealing with and uh, hope to see you soon in our uh, future workshops and uh, conferences. Thank you.